now we have a free civil society uh, speakers. Uh, so first, um, Myrtle Clark will join us. Uh, Myrtle is a founding director of Fields of uh, Green for All and continues to oversee their efforts. And she's based in South Africa. So Myrtle, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matei. And how lovely to see all of our, our colleagues here today. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to present perspectives from Sub-Saharan Africa. South Africa is no stranger to the challenges posed by synthetic drugs and its increasing threat. Working in the cannabis sector, our NGO has experienced firsthand the effects of the criminalization of drug users and the futile efforts at stemming the tide of synthetics in Africa. Our perspective is historical and twofold. First of all, the effects of prohibition and the colonial capture of our cannabis. And secondly, the effects of the infiltration of synthetic drugs amidst vast legal and regulatory uncertainty. These two perspectives are inextricably linked. Uh, this week at the New York um, ECOSOC Partnership Forum, it was interesting to hear the representative from Canada referring to the Sustainable Development Goals as the report card of the world. Now, we always like to bring the Sustainable Development Goals into, into these discussions because Fields of Green for All invites the coalition to reflect on these goals and how we can work towards their achievement by looking at the bigger picture when it comes to synthetic drugs. So we need, to, in order to look at the bigger picture, we need to look at our history. The prohibition of traditional herbal intoxicants began with the opium wars of the 19th century. 20th, the 20th century saw geopolitical issues increase in prohibitionist approaches to the so-called scourge of drugs. And in the 21st century, we are seeing tentative efforts to address the wrongs of the past. One cannot separate the past from the present. What would have happened if herbal drugs used by humankind for millennia had not been banned 100 years ago? Would young people use synthetic neocannabinoids if cannabis access had not been destroyed? Who would use fentanyl today if opium was available? Look back at what 100 years of prohibition did. It fueled the replacement of moderately harmful drugs with always newer, increasingly more harmful substances. Who would have thought our communities were ever, would ever be flooded with synthetic cannabis? There is a pattern here. They banned opium and we got morphine. They banned morphine and we got heroin. They banned heroin and we got fentanyl. They banned fentanyl and we got carfentanyl. We people who use drugs are afraid of the next unintended consequence of these policies. But if we had to come into the present, valuable resources are being spent on keeping the original sources of synthetic drugs illegal, or at best, severely limited in access. Cannabis is an example of such, as in South Africa, we see imported synthetic neocannabinoid products being sold on the street while our rural farmers are facing increasing challenges with their herbal crop. In the US a few months ago, the Journal of the American Medical Association published a study showing higher use of synthetic cannabinoids in states where herbal cannabis is still prohibited. This strongly suggests that the prohibition of herbal drugs unintentionally promotes synthetic drug use. Continued criminalization, victimization, and stigmatization of, of drug users, cultivators, and traders of herbal drugs is particularly prevalent in developing countries where moral and historic prohibition, often based in religious dogma, is the norm in these societies. We must not forget that prohibition policies originate in racist and outdated moralist movements of the past, perpetuating a system that affects the health and safety of the most vulnerable and marginalized of us the world over, particularly local communities and indigenous people. This repression also affects grassroots activists and collectives the very same people who are formulating and experimenting with sustainable drug policy alternatives for the future of all. 
Prohibition and stigma keep these activist organizations with little funding, censoring and uprooting the possibilities for future change. Continued criminalization also threatens the valuable cultures and traditional knowledge of local communities working with cannabis, coca, opium, fungi, kratom, ibogaine, to name but a few, in both rural and urban areas. But we don't want to get stuck in the, in the past or stuck in the present for that matter, and we need to also look forward to the future. We know everything about herbal drugs. By making them legal, we divert, divert users away from novel and synthetic drugs, of which we know nothing. Legalizing cannabis, coca, opium and fungi and their well-known derivatives is the most efficient strategy to reduce demand for synthetic drugs. After all, as this Global Coalition's website states, the synthetic drugs are, and I quote, often more potent and more lethal than plant-based drugs, end quote. Let's make the safer alternatives legal. Last week, very interestingly, the Amsterdam's mayor declared, in addition to reducing stigmatization, responsible legal regulation can redirect government resources towards effective prevention, treatment, and harm reduction services. The legalization of herbal drugs with a focus on human rights and harm reduction are the only interventions that will, that will benefit public health anywhere in the world and make most synthetic drugs simply irrelevant. Fields of Green for All, with its global partners of the Cannabis Embassy, is intent on helping resolve these complex issues by exposing the world to alternatives to prohibition that offer a sustainable future, a future where users move away from synthetic drugs as a matter of course and as a result of informed evidence-based policies. We wouldn't be here today if herbal intoxicants had never been prohibited. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you all in Vienna in March.